All right, what to play today? What to play? Perfect! So I just got done with a, a, relatively speaking, huge marathon covering the Mario franchise. It lasted well over a year, and I am tired. So I need a palate cleanser. You know, I just thought the, you know, I just, I just thought those games were way too good. I need something that will change the course of history. Something that can only be comprehended by the most sophisticated of media analysts, so that I may finally be able to prove how smart I am not, and how truly incomprehensibly genius the work in question is. And I think I found the perfect candidate. Yeah, today I've got a very special game to show off, one I've actually been meaning to talk about since even before my Mario coverage started. Of course, it's none other than the game, the myth, the legend itself, Frogger the Great Quest, released in 2001 on the PlayStation 2. You may be wondering what the hell this game even is. Hell, you may even be asking me right now, what the fuck, Mr. Diamond Miner Man, whoever the hell, what is this game? Why have I never heard of this one? Huh? What is, what's that all about? Is your head shoved way too far up your- Well, if you give me a second, allow me to enlighten you. This one requires a bit of a personal story. It was August 2020. High school had just ended with a graduation ceremony, thankfully, and summer break was about to come to an end. College was right around the corner. I was sitting at home watching YouTube videos because, again, 2020. And I gasp as YouTube's recommendation system actually does its job for once, and I see a new video from one of my subscriptions, Nitro Rat. The video was on this weird 6th gen Frogger game called Frogger Beyond, part of a Frogger game's retrospective. How many times am I gonna say Frogger in one f Apparently Frogger- Son of a bitch. Apparently Frogger had way more games than just the arcade stuff, and I do mean way more games. I then laid eyes on the thumbnail for Frogger the Great Quest. As soon as I watched that video, a switch flipped in my brain. I knew this was something I needed to play for myself. The game looks simply amazing! You know what they say, it's hard to look away from a train wreck, and even harder to keep yourself from participating. Wait, uh, I, th I think I might, I think I might have- Anyway, I simply could not wait on playing this game. I needed it, and I needed it right fucking then. Instead of making the greatest purchase in my life and having to wait a week for it to ship, I opted for the emulator route. Yeah, this game is the entire reason I got into PS2 emulation in the first place. Tell that to your congressman. So, I installed PCSX2, retrieved the game, and jumped right in. And I had no idea what I was in for. As I played, the Red Sea parted again and opened a path. The pyramids awakened and started to rise from the ashes. All the world's waterfalls came came to a stop. My third eye was open, and I saw into the fabric of the universe and all its inner workings, and I ascended into the status of a transcendent immortal being and- Alright, I don't know why I'm writing this crap. In other words, Funny Frog Game changed my life. This is not necessarily a review. This game is beyond the capability of being reviewed in the traditional sense. Instead, see this video as a sort of documentation. A recounting of the absolute amazingness new word, I guess, that I have witnessed. I've come back to this game more than once, and feel I'm finally ready to get up on my soapbox and preach its good word. And by good word, I mean the trash- oh sorry, I mean treasure from the flaming exploded dumpster located in Detroit that this masterpiece originated from- oh sorry, I mean the New York penthouse it came from. Uh, if you can't tell, this is gonna be an interesting one. I'm by no means the first person to make a video about it, but I feel it's m my calling. My obligation to- you know, at least mention it at some point. Mostly because if I didn't, I'd be missing out in a gold mine. Be forewarned though, prolonged exposure to this masterwork may cause your own third eye to open and for you to gain knowledge you might not be ready for. If you can't handle that, I'd recommend you get ready because there's no turning back now. Once you've seen what I've seen, <laughs> You'll be a changed person, no exceptions. With that said. So we open up by finding out that the masterpiece of the hour is made by a company that is definitely good. They have absolutely never done anything wrong in their entire history and are in no way evil and money hungry and a menace to society and their employees. Do not look them up because there is definitely nothing to see- Oh god damn it! Papa Yeti Studio, huh? Sounds like some true masters of their craft and definitely not a made up studio that Konami created to cover their tracks. Although, maybe that theory doesn't hold much weight, they still plastered their name on it. I don't know why they wouldn't though, because as you'll see, this game is totally, definitely, absolutely, no doubt in my mind, something any professional would not only put on their resume, but would highlight as an item of special interest for any potential employers. Alright, title screen. Looks absolutely beautiful, a true masterwork in every sense of the word. This wonderful clip art looking scroll for the options. The forest, that's definitely not just a screenshot from a cutscene environment. Large in charge over here giving you that look. It just screams quality right away. This will be an experience like no other. I then name myself the only appropriate username, and into the first cutscene we go. I'd first like to call attention to the absolutely wonderful character designs. You simply can't get better than this. It looks like they were all plucked from the swamp and then run over by a steamroller. Also, take a listen real quick. How you Frog? Okay, I guess. This can't be the only jambalaya being served, Lumpy. 
I want to zap new bugs, swim new streams, be frog loose and froggy free. That's the kind of spectacular acting that only comes around once a century. Definitely doesn't make you want to tear your ears off, right? Oh yeah, fun fact, this one kid is also voiced by Tails. Did the princess stop running? I'll go and find the entrance. Actually, come to think of it, there's apparently a lot of Sonic crossover in this game. There's also Eggman himself, Dean Bristow, and, and Ronnie Minello, voice of Rouge, apparently candle casting. All these actors were great in the Sonic games, but I think it's safe to say this is by far their most significant roles. In all seriousness though, I find it interesting how they chose to do this game and since it came out in 2001. There's no doubt they worked on it at the same time as SA2. I just love the idea that after they finished the work for the day on that huge blockbuster release, they drove over to the Konami offices, or sorry, I mean the Papa Yeti offices for this. And at any rate, I got a bit distracted there. What's even going on in this game? What's the story? So one day Frogger and his, I don't know, mafia boss Lumpy are sitting in their swamp at the they're sitting in their swamp and talking about stuff and things. Out of nowhere, these two random kids show up talking about, uh, something about a frog saving the princess. It doesn't matter, it causes this enlightening moment. Poof! The frog turned into a prince. I think you know what's going on here, I don't really need to explain any further. Suddenly, bees! No, really, just like that, they appear and they're evil, I guess, maybe. They attack the kids as they run away with the greatest animation this side of the city. Frogger and Lumpy just sit there and watch. Bonjour! Oh no, he's a Frenchman. Doesn't fucking matter because we get the greatest line ever written in an artistic work. Huh? That's it! A wish upon a falling star! I wish I may, I wish I must find a princess before I bust! Do I need to explain myself further? This is by far unquestionably the finest line in all of gaming history. I think you understand why I wanted to cover this game now, and trust me, it has many more similar strokes of absolute genius like this one. Oh yeah, and uh, Frogger's wish actually works. A character by the name of Fairy Frogmother, haha very clever, appears. Frogger tells her he wants the princess and she just agrees no catch she even gives three gifts to him first he can now use magic in other words these strange runes that give abilities when used in game second Voila! A magic bag. And I don't need <laughs> yeah uh a magic bag whatever she just said last but not least the most important gift that of protection now you cannot die while in pursuit of princess hot lips wait wh what what Excuse me, he can't die? No seriously, she just casually grants him the ability to not die right there. And of course, it's the gift she spends by far the least amount of time explaining out of the three. She then leaves, refusing to elaborate about the fact that Frogger is literally incapable of dying now, and he just sets out on his quest just like that. No more questions needed. Obviously, this is just a really strange way of justifying how you come back after dying, but I thought that was universally accepted as a game mechanic representing a sort of time warp back to before you died. I don't remember when games needed a way to actually explain that in a narrative sense. My fucking head hurts. I'm so glad they did it this way though, because it makes this game all the more special. Barker gets immortality just like that, and yet the character that gave it to him finds it fitting to spend more time explaining magic powers in a freaking $10 bag from the local target she gave him. Well, as you can clearly tell, we are in for an absolute treat today. It's clear from the opening you just witnessed that we are dealing with the work of a true master. It's no more evident in the absolutely phenomenal visuals. I mean, just take a look at it. That flat water, the blurry textures, those models that look straight out of the N64 despite the game coming out on the PS2, all very forward thinking of them to do. Also, the best part, the game is interlaced, and you all know how much I love interlacing. Unfortunately though, the emulator kind of fixes that, so you won't be getting the authentic, intended experience. It is truly a shame that I cannot properly represent the raw, unfiltered artistic vision of these masters of their craft, but that's kind of how things are sometimes, unfortunately. It's a blue disc game, meaning it will probably make my PS2 explode, so emulation it is. Oh yeah, by the way, I do own this game physically. I couldn't resist having this artistic masterwork in my possession to get stuck loaded on the steamboat level as an eternal black screen. Delicious. In this first level, Rolling Rapids Creek, these masterful visuals become evident right away. Looks absolutely beautiful, especially when you get to this one pond and the water is completely still. It's a commentary on the fragility of nature and how mankind's ecological destruction can cause it to stand still. Or maybe they just forgot to animate the water because they ran out of time. Y your choice. Regardless, how about that gameplay? It's a video game after all. Let me tell you, this game is by far the best control scheme ever in the history of the medium. There's this really amazing bug, oh sorry, I mean feature that Frogger's momentum is completely screwed. Holding forward causes him to take off at the speed of sound right away, and jumping feels like he's a balloon with absolutely no weight whatsoever, which is exactly why this game is so great. You wouldn't want it to be too easy, now would you? Then there's no challenge, and therefore no fun. Also, the button mappings are by far the best I have ever seen. 
no right stick camera and instead you can only center it by pressing R2 or by clicking in the right stick to enter first person I suppose. Now that's the sign of a quality production right there. Another great thing is how the levels are designed which we get a really quick sampling of here in the Rapids Creek. It's a straight line river you can swim through and you have to jump occasionally. Wonderful. You know what, doesn't this game seem familiar in some ways? Frogger attacks with projectiles and strafes in circles. The models and textures look like that. This move to slow your descent disturbingly, seems pretty similar to another game that only came out a few years before this one. I'm not the first one to point it out, but this game is basically uh, not the most original. In fact, it's quite similar to another game you might have heard of called uh, Rayman 2. I can picture the pitch meeting right now. We'll have the greatest game ever, the nondescript worker says, and then the CEO asks, all right, but how will the gameplay, and then he just says Rayman 2 knockoff, but it's a masterpiece. Perfect suggestion, Frank, you get a promotion. You get 15 promotions. You could be the CEO and run the company. And that's how Konami died. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. In any case, the first level is an amazing tutorial as I went into and really needs no more elaboration. After this, the game truly begins, complete with yet another moment of voice acting genius. Oh yeah! Come to daddy! Are you beginning to see my point? This game's immense artistic genius permeates through every aspect of it, especially its non-gameplay elements, which propel it to new heights. As you just heard, a voice actor was given the direction to read that line while doing that voice, and the developers made it play there intentionally for the player to fucking hear it. Absolutely amazing. Anyway, these next few levels are easily some of the greatest in history, quite possibly THE greatest. No, I am in no way being sarcastic. What the hell crap is sarcasm anyway? First in the bunch is this one where you have to help the Charmin Ultrasoft bear, except he's a heavy alcoholic get some honey you'll then have to walk over to some bees get the honey bring it back to the blue bear guy and you win that's the structure of most of these levels actually you'll just walk around looking for something collect it or otherwise do something and boom level over a great comparison i've heard is this imagine if in super mario 64 every level had barely any enemies or whatever in it and all you had to do was find a single star out in the open somewhere once you collect it there wouldn't be anything else to do in the level so basically they'd make these decently sized sandboxes for you to run around in but you could safely ignore pretty much all of them in favor of finding one objective, which is yet another reason why this game is a masterpiece. They're so good, you don't even need to interact with the majority of what each level has, giving the player the freedom of choice to either play the game, or waste their fucking time. Absolutely brilliant, if you ask me. After that is two of the most amazingest levels ever constructed. That is definitely a real word. Immediately next is Slick Willy's Riverboat, which is definitely not a completely confusing maze-like mess. Alliteration is a good thing. Here you have to fight some cats who talk like the distinguished gentleman who developed this artistic achievement. Oh, so you want to mess up my card game? But I only want to- Oh, a wise guy, eh? Get him, boys. <laughs> This level sees you taking them out, wandering around aimlessly for a bit, going into first person mode and shooting the spell, wandering about for a little more doing fuck all until you find a key, unlocking a door, and out of nowhere this crocodile guy makes his presence known. With again, some of the best voice acting I think I've ever heard in my life. The River Princess? Can I meet the princess? You wanna see the River Princess? <laughs> You're standing on her, silly. What follows is, you know what, here you go. I'll just let the game do the talking here. Stop that! Stop that! Stop that! You're not so tough! Oh! Wow, you done whooped me good, boy! Isn't that the greatest boss design you've ever laid eyes on? See how all I had to do there was walk into his ass and mindlessly spam the attack button? You heard more of that wonderful, amazing acting and dialogue that this game, as I've established, has by now. I do not need to elaborate since it's pretty evident what kind of game we're dealing with. A similarly incredible experience awaits us in the next level, Rivertown. Here, Frogger again goes through that wonderful structure of having to track something down. A sick fairy is in the house, and you have to find a key somewhere. It's actually right next to his house, pretty much, on a small roof. No more than like 10 feet or 3 meters away. Not challenging, pseudo exciting, definitely Frogger the Great Quest. Also, the fairy looks like this. <laughs> oh my god! Just, just take that in. Let it sit for a little while and sink it. What? He wants a magic clover. It's right over here in this chest. That looks like a clover. Well, you bring it back to him and... Oh, well, I'm sorry, nightmare-inducing fairy person. I'm sorry, it looks the exact fucking same as the real one. Yeah, they pulled the same joke as the penguin from Cool Cool Mountain, but the identical-looking fake item. I'll bet they thought they were being real cute or clever, but in reality, they were redefining the standards of the medium while they were at it. Every future developer will look back to this absolute masterpiece for inspiration, I'm sure. Anywho, in the next level, a similar thing happens. You'll have to open three doors to find the pieces of a key to open another door, and one of them involves opening some chests in the correct order. God 
Damn, can these developers come up with something original for- Oh, sorry, I mean, game is an amazing masterpiece that redefine industry. I'm not losing mind, you is. Oh yeah, and this level is called Mushroom Valley, which is a prototype name for Mushroom Hill in Sonic 3, so that's neat. Well, fuck that, because it's fairy town time, bitches! This bad boy is the embodiment of everything that makes this wonderful experience everything that it is. A bastion of its overwhelming, uh, artistic genius, I suppose you could say. It starts off with these fairies, which definitely do not inspire nightmares in the kids that played this decades ago, staring you down like a it's a cult meeting. I don't know if it was a good idea to come here, Frogger. Oh, hey, what's, what's that sound? man that's actually pretty damn good like unironically good anyway the fairies ask you to do five tasks search around the area for five seeds and plant each one sounds simple enough and it is but once you're done with it the fairies give you the true reality of the situation there i finished planting the seeds good enough can i see the princess now no that wasn't all five tasks that was only the first one. Oh yeah the seed gathering was only the first of five tasks. Wonder for how they set the player up like that, very forward thinking of them. The fairies force Frogger to enter a cave in which there is a sign warning you of scorpions, which is why throughout the entire cave you'll only be fighting snakes, spiders, and this one guy about to roll up and ask you what the definition of insensitive is. If you get that reference, you deserve a cookie. Oh yes, and when you defeat him, there's this scene where Frogger sees himself in the Reaper, like he's Luke Skywalker seeing his own dark side or something. Oh shit, seems like the story is going places. Except... No. Frogger brings it up to the fairies, who have a, uh, interesting response. Uh, I saw... myself? Oh yeah! He saw himself! <laughs> Shut up! And after that, it's never mentioned again. Genius writing on display here, truly the work of a master of their profession. Anyways, the fairies then decide the best course of action is to play hide and seek with Frogger. He then has to enter the cave of this Shrek sounding cat dragon and, uh, avoid being eaten for him to get a riddle. I guess. I can see you have a great quest before. Alright, fine, I'll continue the game. In this level, the dragon shoots at you from above. Now, the best part about this is that the camera doesn't follow him or show you where he is whatsoever, so you can be caught off guard by his fire and die. Not that dying means diddly dick squat, since you have infinite lives as a result of the frog fairy lady's immortality, and checkpoints are very frequent, but still. What I'm saying is, this is a perfect level, no flaws, 10 out of 10 masterpiece. If you're trying to fail and succeed, which have you done? Is that a developer commentary on this game? Well, it doesn't matter because the fairies want to play tag. Hell yeah, exciting gameplay action. Wait a minute. Frogger entered this town in the spring, then entered the cave and emerged during the summer, then went into the dragon's lair and came out during the, the, the fall. Doesn't, doesn't that mean he spent several months in this town and by extension the caves and, and the, the lair? They really are a cult. They held Frogger here for months and with disposed of promise of a princess. For what purpose? Nobody can say for sure. Their goals transcend traditional understanding. Well, that princess does actually exist and she rejects Frogger because she isn't the real princess or something. Next is some cave or something that Frogger has to go through. This one actually has scorpions. Uh, here's, here's this thing which has some of the greatest AI ever programmed. This happens when you shoot this elevator to go up. It has a minotaur or something. Yeah. Frogger then ends up in this castle with a mad doctor who looks suspiciously like Phoenix Wright, and he talks like this for some reason. It's not safe outside after dark. I unironically like how the way forward is this is with a secret passageway through a bookshelf. That's always cool. <laughs> Gruntilda makes a surprise appearance, except not really. She's the legally distinct version. Frogger then finds Dr. Starkenstein in his lab with something called the Metal Chicken Ray, which is apparently a Metal Gear reference that I just didn't get until now.
I just... Do I need to say anything more? Anyway, this fight's pretty simple. Just break these blue lights on top of the machines and you win. Not that anything tells you this is what you have to do, so it's possible to spend minutes upon minutes just running around aimlessly with no idea what you have to do here. With how the chicken ray got introduced, you'd think you have to fight it directly, right? No, instead you have to intuit that you should be breaking these blue light thingies. Apparently, frog fairy woman lady tells you that you have to do this, but with all the noise that's going on, it's a little hard to hear. Again, what I'm getting at here is that this game is so amazing that who even needs directions or logical means of conveyance because real men don't need instructions as home improvement teaches okay this is pissing me off um okay so uh this is a game rated e for everyone what can i even say anymore what else is there even left to say well uh next uh we have this uh cave again there's another damn cave level that's it's like there's like three of them but hey in this one dracula vampire guy man comes in and chases you down these halls and you have to run away from him i suppose but actually he's not evil he's a fruit fruit bat and so only drinks fruit juice and no blood whew that was a close one he then he goes through the door as it's closed already and he phases through it i cannot even begin to describe the legendary animation this is absolutely masterwork i can't comprehend the brilliant ingenuity on display here because it's quite evident by this point what's that you're doubting my authenticity you think i'm being sarcastic how dare you believe such a thing i am disgusted by your doubt it should be very clear from this game that i am definitely not a sarcasm right now not ever my brain be leaking after it melted into sludge i am losing all my mind Walking at the speed of one tenth of a snail in molasses. Because this game wants you to get the absolute most out of its amazing content. It does things like this. Screw anything else. Let's just have the player wait for these things so that their time is spent observing the intensely rich detailed graphics and aesthetics. So next up we exit the cave and end up in this canyon looking place known as the Goblin Trail. And this is the uh, best level in the game by far. You know what it is? A directionless fucking maze. That's what it is. You'll be wandering around not knowing what the fuck to do. It's always appreciated when a game does that, and it is by far my most loved thing in all of the medium as I went over with the whole chicken ray thing. When a game makes the bold decision to make the way forward as obtuse as possible for the sake of making the player be able to enjoy the game for much longer than expected. Here, have a montage from the epic amazing gameplay in store for this level. Looks fun, doesn't it? Guess how you beat this level. You'll have to kill this one huge goblin, after which the key just decides to appear and let you into the next area over near this rock formation. Nice touch. Speaking of which, I better mention the combat. You've got two options. Ranged, and fuck you. I mentioned already that Frogger can spit slime balls of sort, like how Rayman can toss energy balls in Great Escape, and how he strafes in circles around enemies, also like that game. Well, there's also melee combat, and it is incredible. Frogger punches and kicks his enemies with extremely satisfying animations, no sarcasm, as he spouts out lines about, and I'm not making this up, Frog Foo. I can't say anything else. Like most other things in this game, it speaks for itself. Oh yeah, and I also forgot to bring up another one of this game's forward-thinking mechanics. Easily one of its greatest ideas that, like everything else I've been describing, makes it stand out as a true masterpiece of game design. After you kill enemies, sometimes you can walk to the last spot they were before they died and still take damage. Their hitboxes linger after they're killed. No, seriously, you can try it out for yourself. Take an enemy and walk around the general area where they last were, and you will take damage from seemingly thin air. I... 
I have no fucking words. What can I say about a game that's this truly, utterly amazing in every sense of the word? What is there to point out when the game itself is so intent on proving how incredible it is with every last aspect of itself? Why the hell do I keep saying the same shit over and over? Am I losing my mind? Is it finally happening? I am being enlightened even further by this incredible video game experience. My third eye is opening yet again and I can see the inside of the universe. The colors smell so loud. It is happening, it is happening, it is happening, it is happening, it is happening. Father, I praise thee. Father, I honor thee. Father, I give the word to thee. Praise Father, praise Father, praise Father, praise Father. Uh. Anyways, next in the level is this absolutely incredible scene. Frogger makes his way into the next part of the canyon, and then this happens. This is real. I did not make this in any way. This is this is in the game. This is real. Well, anywho, Frogger takes the King Goblin out and steals his crown and searches for another key because fuck originality, embrace repetition, and then kills another goblin and rips off the ending sequence of Hydro City Zone. And there's Sonic reference number three. At any rate, Frogger then ends up in this weird goblin town that's been destroyed by a war, and you has to once again wander around aimlessly until you find a key in this weird goblin motherfucker and comes and takes it. He'll be hiding in barrels around this place, and in a genius gameplay segment, you'll have to track him down and get the key back. You can then move on to this other area with goblins that randomly come which are best dealt with uh, using a fire rune if you have one by the way there's these colored runes this orange one gives you a fire attack the blue one is fucking useless and the green one makes frogger run quicker like he's sonic and there's reference number four so that's cool but uh what's even going on right now after that cave level with discount dracula the game seemingly dropped any semblance of story or even simply telling you what's even happening no context we're just running through these places looking for a princess i guess maybe and again this is another aspect that just makes this game so great context is for losers. Which is why in the next level, Frogger suddenly ends up at a castle that wasn't visible in the distance in the previous stage, so that's cool. Upon starting the level, you'll see a knight fighting with some goblins, as another one runs in and declares his intentions to attack. It seems like a fight is brewing, but nope, you actually have to run inside the building and start attacking the goblins in there to progress. Then the level becomes another amazingly epic maze that I definitely do not despise, as you must find another key to get the hell out of here. Are you starting to notice a pattern because I sure am, my brain is melting again. Well, this level is really short and Frogger then enters the castle's towers. This is the final stage and it's absolutely great, especially since there's these parts that seemingly trick you into accidentally backtracking. Great bug, oh sorry, I mean feature. Regardless, after many centuries of walking around these towers and slowly losing any of my sanity, oh sorry, I mean having my enlightenment ex further expand further, Frogger finally reaches the princess's room and out of nowhere, this guy appears as the main villain, I guess. Time to kick his ass. It's time for the final boss, baby! This boss is extremely tough and requires you to throw everything you've got at him. It tests everything you've learned that the game has so masterfully taught you and is the ultimate final exam for the entire game. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. It's already over. It's ended. That, 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 was, that, was, that was the final boss. That... I can't think of a better final boss than the absolute master genius, ingenuity, brilliance, artistic mastercraft we have just witnessed on display right here. It's a true commentary on the nature of life. Sometimes it's just disappointing and you've got to live with it because it's how things are. You may be expecting a tough trial that requires your full effort, but in reality, you've got an easy win on your hands. Be grateful because otherwise you could be under the surface if you catch my cold. In any case, the final cutscene plays out as Frogger finally wins against that one guy and he jumps from the tower. Frogger then gets the princess's kiss and he becomes a prince. Wow, so he was a prince all along. What a twist. I am truly shocked. Best part is that he did nothing to win said kiss. All he did was decide one day after hearing some kids talking, I want a damn princess like that mushroom consuming Italian plumber guy and runs around ruining fucking everything in this hellscape world where there's seemingly no civil order and sh as shit just happens around him. A true coming of age classic. After this scene is a weird montage of Frogger, becoming a frog again, I guess, as he goes on more adventures. Also, Fiery McFirefuck, who we randomly ran into at the end of the game, is still alive and probably planning to cause chaos yet again, thus teasing a sequel that, sadly, never happened. A true shame, since you saw how incredibly amazing this game was. I think that's about it for today. This game is something truly special. It's a special game that only comes around once or twice every console generation. A true masterpiece. 
of absolute absurdity and crappy poopy smell stink. I am sorry, as my brain is still broke now. Oh wait, I mean enlightened by this game's mastery of trash. In all seriousness, you saw how it was. You saw the putrid gameplay, the puke-inducing camera, the ugly graphics, the amazingly stupid story, and all that stuff. It's the kind of game you see for cheap one day at a store, pick up, gather a few comrades, get some drinks going if necessary, and then just go fucking wild. I would say a blind playthrough is the best, because it's a lot funnier that way, but I know that's not really possible if you watch this video in full. If for some reason you skip to the end and are listening to this right now, play this game. Hell, even if you watch the whole thing, I'd still recommend it. Not because it's good, because Christ, have you seen this thing? But because it's an experience that everyone should have. If you need a good laugh, this is the game to go to. It's objectively atrocious, but because of the things I went over, I can't hate it. It's just too funny and has way too much ironic entertainment to pass up. That's all I have. I joked about my brain melting into sludge multiple times, but fuck me if it doesn't feel like that happened. I surely hope that you enjoyed watching my descent into insanity because I had fun documenting it. This game is what comes to mind immediately when I think of guilty pleasures, and that's why I pl I've played it more than once despite its status as, uh, being objectively anti-good. My next video will be more serious than this one, well, about as serious as these videos can be. Who am I kidding? I meant business more than I ever have in my whole life in this video, and that is objective fact. No, but really. This was a shorter video for a change, which is good, because my next few- Oh dear, are they gonna be something else? Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. I wish I may, I wish I must find a princess before I- Boss!